There we go. There we go. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I would like to call the meeting to order. Uh, may have a few people still floating in here. Uh, I know there's one for sure going to be out. He's not feeling too well today, but he'll be back. Um, first off, do we have any bills to introduce? Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is David Nickel. I'm consumer counsel for the Citizens Utility Ratepayer Board. Please allow me to introduce RS-0117. This bill allows just and reasonable energy assistance for Kansas low-income residential utility ratepayers. Thank you very much. Um, committee, any questions on that? Any objections? Then consider it entered. Thank you. Any additional, Mr. Schneider? Uh, Paul Schneider with Kansas for Lower Electric Rates uh, would like to request the committee introduce RS-0516. That is a bill that would make KCC commissioners elected positions and create other KCC reforms. Committee, any questions? Any objections? <laughs> Consider entered. And I have another one, uh, still representing Kansas for lower electric rates. I would request the committee introduce RS-0515, and that is a bill that requires the KCC to assess rate competitiveness and the impact of economic development when setting rates. Okay. And again, committee, any questions? Any objections? Considered in, sir. Thank you. Any additional bills to introduce? All right. Well, seeing none, we'll move right on. Um, we have got Connie Owen, who's the director of Kansas Water Office. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hang on just a second? I skipped over one. Do we have the, everybody should have received the minutes from Tuesday. So, any questions or anything on the minutes? And if not, do I have a motion to approve? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to, for us to approve the minutes. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Uh, can the record show Chuck Smith seconding? All approved. Any, any objections? All right, minutes are approved. Okay, Connie, sorry about that. So come on up. I was jumping ahead of myself there. So, and Connie is with, with the, you're the director of the Kansas Water Office. And everybody, if you know, it was a week ago today, we were hearing some testimony on possible hydrogen production and so forth. So I thought it's probably best that we get uh, the water office in here. And I don't, I'm not expecting the presentation to be focused on that, but just kind of an overview and let you take it away as far as water in the state of Kansas. So welcome. Is there a blue light lit up? There's a red light. That there you go. There you go. It's red. Okay. My bad. So go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much for having me this morning. My name is Connie Owen and I'm the director of the Kansas water office. And um, I would just sort of immediately springboard off of the chair's comments that um, this committee is thinking in terms of the water aspects of the work that you do. And I commend you very much for that because what you do, what we do are not separate. Um, water, as you know, impacts everything in the state, every activity from large scale irrigation to every industry to turning on your tap and taking a shower. So, um, I appreciate the awareness that we need to work together to make things successful. As I'm sure many of you are aware, there are many agencies in the state of Kansas whose work impacts water. There are three primary agencies, and I will mention them to you. We are one of them. Just so you sort of have a framework for how is water addressed and managed in general in the state. The first agency I'll mention is the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. They handle water quality. When there are water quality issues, that is their wheelhouse. They are the lead agency. 
They do permitting, they do enforcement, they are regulatory. When it comes to water quantity, who gets to use it, water rights, enforcement, uh, water allocations, that is the division of water resources within the Department of Agriculture. So we have the quantity agency, quant quality agency, both of those are regulatory. The third agency is the water office. We are not regulatory. We don't permit anything. We don't mandate anything. We don't enforce anything. The reason my office exists is our mission um, do I have my slides? It was just kind of, I was waiting for this <laughs> point. I was kind of waiting until there was something to <laughs> yeah. refer to. Could IT, could we please get the PowerPoint up on the screen? Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Connie, for bringing that up. All right, next slide, please. Okay, our, my agency mission, fundamentally, the Water Office was created to be the coordination policy planning and marketing agency for all things water. So knowing that there are a variety of agencies with differing duties and responsibilities, the state recognized it was important to coordinate and cooperate um, with those different duties. The water office is that office. So you can see here um, our agency mission that we provide the framework policy and tools in concert with those agency partners and with stakeholders to manage, secure, and protect a reliable and safe water supply. So our work spans water quantity, water quality, groundwater, surface water, all the water needs of the state. Our flagship responsibility is to develop the Kansas Water Plan. And this is a comprehensive, massive document this year, we updated it for the first time in several years, and it's in the neighborhood of 300 pages, but it identifies all the water needs in the state and sets out recommendations for what to do about those particular needs. That plan is developed in a very bottom-up framework, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. Another purpose of our agency, as I mentioned, is coordinating the resource operations of all of the water agencies and at all levels of government. We work with federal government and we work with local government and local entities. We also help efficiently manage water in our federal reservoirs. So I'll discuss that a little bit more detailed in a minute. Next slide. The water office has two main programs. So those two orange boxes, the one on the left, water planning and implementation, and the one on the right, public water supply. I'll address the, first, the three components of water planning first. Next slide, please. You may have heard of the Kansas Water Authority. The Kansas Water Authority is an advisory board. It is created by statute. It is part of the water office, but these are um, volunteers, true public servants. They are um, charged with studying and advising the legislature and the governor and the director of the water office on water policy, water management, pretty much anything within the spectrum of water concerns. The advisory board has voting members and non-voting members. What you're looking at with this map are the voting members on the Water Authority. Of these 13, 11 are appointed by the governor. Each one of them, as you can see, designated under their name, this shows where they live, is the um, water use group that they are supposed to represent on the Water Authority. So the 11 of these are governor's appointees. Two of them are legislative. One is appointed by the Speaker of the House. One is appointed by the President of the Senate. Next slide. The non-voting members of this advisory board are basically the officials from all of the state agencies whose work impacts water or whose work um, is impacted by water. So we have, as you can see on the list, a lot of different agencies and interests within 
um, the state, including educational institutions and research entities such as K-State and the Kansas Geological Survey. So their involvement is to bring their expertise, to provide information, to be a part of discussions, to help guide the voting members with their work. Next slide, please. So the Water Authority was one of those three planning components. The second component is our water planning and implementation job. As I mentioned, a flagship responsibility of my office is develop, to develop the Kansas Water Plan. By statute, this is to identify, and there is a laundry list of things in the statute that we need to look at and, and um, include and consider. The way this is formed, as I said, was a very grassroots process. The map on this page at the bottom shows our 14 regional planning areas around the state. Each one of those areas has a regional advisory committee. Each of these committees has local volunteers who are experts, boots on the ground, water users, local people, they know their issues, they know what works in their area, and their job is to meet and identify their needs, develop um, goals, action plans, and make recommendations to pass up to that regional advisory board, to the Kansas Water Authority. They also, and part of their recommendations, is to help recommend the expenditure of state water plan funds, which is a fund that's created to help pay for what's in the water plan. So we start with this grassroots effort. We have 140 some people that make up these regional advisory committees. And so that starts at the lowest level, moves up to the water authority, the advisory board, and then my office, in concert with the agencies, with their input, public comments, stakeholders, we develop the Kansas Water Plan. It's not just identifying needs, it also identifies recommendations for what should happen. And although my office is charged with developing that plan, the plan is not officially approved by the state unless the Water Authority approves it. So that is one of their big jobs. And in December, the Kansas Water, or I'm sorry, in August, the Water Authority approved the latest update of the Kansas Water Plan. And I might mention at any time, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or interrupt, or I'm happy to take them at the end as well. So the third component of our planning and implementation responsibilities is drought monitoring and response which as many of you can imagine has been um, an active and intense um, component this past year. The water office is responsible for monitoring drought conditions and we monitor that with various state and federal agencies and, and entities. When we um, come to the conclusion that conditions exist regarding, regarding needing a different drought declaration than the most recent one that was passed, then my office convenes the drought response team. And the drought response team is state agencies, federal agencies, get everybody in a room, look at all the science, look at the forecasts and say, what do we need to let the governor know about the conditions in each county and what level of declaration does that group think is appropriate for each county? I will show you the latest map a little bit later in my slides. The reason for this declaration, which by the way does come through a governor's executive order, is to open the door to assistance. It's like when there's a federal disaster declared out of Washington. The reason to do that is that opens the door for assistance for those impacted by drought. So the drought declarations that the governor makes in response to the drought response team, that's what that's for, is to help people who are um, impacted by severe drought conditions. So thinking back, yes, sir. Uh, I think I, I know the answer, but uh, when you say open the door to that assistance, 
you're just uh, cracking it open so that agencies that are, are allowed to provide funds to them can do it through that door. Is that correct? As far as funding for, for uh, drought situations, or you're opening the door uh, so that those agencies can be asked for funds and, and, and give. Is that correct? That in part, yes, but it's not just funding. So for example, um, there are actions that are sort of on standby at any given time that can then be triggered. So say early on, and kind of surprising to some people, the southeast part of the state was one of the earliest, most severely impacted areas with the drought this past year. And there were requests for assistance with watering livestock. One of the things that that emergency declaration allows is immediately working with the state wildlife department of wildlife and parks to provide and allow for state fishing lake water to help water cattle we can get a hold of the federal government and ask and work with them to make emergency releases out of reservoirs so it's not just asking for money it's it's also brings in help thanks ma'am thank you mm -hmm. okay so the water planning and implementation component was one of the two big chunks of what we do. The other big chunk, so to speak, is our public water supply program. The map that you're looking at are reservoirs within the state of Kansas. The very dark blue are the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers reservoirs, and the lighter shade of blue are the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation reservoirs. The federal government constructed reservoirs decades ago at different times, primarily for the purpose of flood control. But arrangements were made with the state for the use of some of the water in those reservoirs. And what form that takes is this. My office, the water office, actually has contracts with the federal government, with the Corps of Engineers, for storage space in those reservoirs. So that is something the state pays for the core four, we have long-term contracts that require the state to pay for storage in those reservoirs. Then what does that mean? Why do we have the storage? So that entities, cities and industries and a couple of different um, districts that exist, they then contract with my office to buy the water and use the water. So for example, the city of Lawrence gets water out of Clinton Lake. So the city of Lawrence has a contract with my office to pay for the water they use out of Clinton. We have a contract with the feds that we're paying for that storage space. So in theory, the cash flow goes, you know, they pay us and we pay them. It's not always balanced and we have, we are on the hook, so to speak, for those contracts, regardless of whether that water is actually used or not, the projections that were made at the time those contracts were drawn up accounted for projected growth and projected future need. So they were thinking ahead, not just what do we need right now, but what do we expect to need in the future. The key is we have to pay for those contracts regardless. So if we have someone, if we have a customer who's paying us, has a contract, uses the water, that's called calling it into service and that triggers operation and maintenance costs that have to be shared by us with the core. But even, as I said, even if we don't have someone who's contracted to use all the water yet, that's called future use storage, then we are going to still need to pay for that. At the end of the contract term, the core is gonna say, okay, it's time to, to you know, finish up the deal. So I have a couple slides ahead that will maybe ex depict that a little bit clearer. Next slide. Say, so, go ahead, Representative. I really never ask the best questions, <clears throat> but who owns the water in Kansas? The people. 
by statute um, in the Kansas Water Appropriation Act, it dedicates all the water in the state of Kansas to the use of the people in Kansas. And so, and then, <clears throat> who owns the property that these lakes are on? The federal government. Federal government owns Kansas land. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead, Connie. So as I mentioned, um, oh, okay, good. That's where I wanted to be. So I mentioned future use storage. This is our requirement to pay for the full contracts we have. Um, and when a contract comes due, we need to pay for it, even if we don't have customers yet that are um, filling in that revenue. The good news is, major thank you to the legislature, to Governor Kelly, Last year, $80 million was appropriated and paid to pay down this debt. So for Hillsdale Lake, Clinton Lake, and Big Hill Lake, we're paid up. So into the future, we will, we will have saved tens of millions of dollars by paying that off early. Because if we waited for those contracts to come due, in the future, there would have been interest compounding along the way. So we've avoided all those interest payments. And for some of them, we did not yet have contracts to buy the water. So we weren't even sure that we were going to have debt service at the same time, if that makes sense. So this was wonderful. So we have this water paid for. Our contracts and for these three reservoirs are done. One of the most important aspects of doing this is not just saving the money, but when the contract is paid off, that water is now in state control. When there's part of our contract that isn't paid for yet, the Corps can still use that water, in the simplest terms, as they see fit. For example, we work intensively with them, my office with the Corps, on do there need to be releases for water quality? Do we need to hold back? Is there, we, do we need to plan for a flood or a drought? These are day-to-day -day and long-term decisions that are constantly being made. But the federal government owns the reservoir. And if they want to make a release, if they want to not make a release, they get to decide that except for the contract that we've paid for. So when we get these contracts paid up, that water is in state control. And even if we aren't using it yet, they can't release it as they want. They can't hold it back as they want. That's for us to decide. So the state control is a, is a very important component to getting this debt paid down. Next slide, please. Governor's budget recommendations last week included paying the rest another $53 million that is still due on Milford and Perry. If that is paid now, as opposed to making payments along over time, if that is paid now, we will save about $29 million and have state control over that water. So we were very excited that that was in the governor's budget recommendations and um, we will be trying to do our best to persuade that that is in the best interest of the state to go forward with that. Moving on, and I hope I'm not running long. I tend to be kind of bad about that. Um, talked about the water office and what we do. Now I'm gonna move into highlighting, touching on major issues. This slide, just to give you a little bit of a framework this is a slide that's created by the Division of Water Resources in the Department of Agriculture. Remember, I mentioned they're the water quantity people, the water rights people. I should give them a big shout out because they, their system of having water use data and collecting it, compiling it, and making it meaningful is the envy of the country. The state of Kansas has one of the best water use data um, databases that exist. And this is one of the things that we can 
C as a result of that information. This depicts the, con the type of use in the state of Kansas of water. So for these circles, there is a circle for each county. The bigger the circle, the more water is used. And the colors represent the type of use. So just in the biggest, most obvious sense, blue being irrigation, you can see that's generally central and then predominant in the western third of the state. The red is municipal use, which of course is going to be in the eastern state and the more urban areas. So I just kind of wanted as a visual, this sort of gives an at a glance view of how much water is used where and for what. Next slide. So the four major issues that I'll touch on today, these are the big four. Um, I just wanna make you aware of them. As I said, there are other agencies that are the experts and can um, definitely provide more specifics and get more in the weeds on them. Next slide. High Plains Aquifer Declines. You've probably heard of the Ogallala Aquifer and the problem with depletion of the Ogallala Aquifer. That's what is in here. That's what we're talking about here. This is a map from the Kansas Geological Survey. They do measurements, they keep data, they are the, the brain trust, the scientists who keep track of water levels and, and what is happening with the aquifer. This map is only obviously part of the state of Kansas, basically from about Wichita West. The High Plains Aquifer has three components in the state of Kansas. The West, where you see the big chunk in the Northwest and a big chunk in the Southwest, that's the Ogallala. You move a little farther East in the middle, that's the Great Bend Prairie. And then there's kind of a almost thumb shaped aquifer to the farthest East there that is the Equus Beds and that's in the Wichita area. So the two Eastern components have a different kind of recharge. They tend to recharge more easily. The real crisis is the Ogallala, which is that Western third. This map that you're looking at depicts most fundamentally how much water is there. How has it changed? What is the change in the amount of water been since pre-development, which is generally prior to large scale irrigation until 2021. So the darker the color, starting with yellows into oranges into reds, the darker the color, the more water has been lost over that period of time. Next slide, please. This is another Kansas Geological Survey map. And this one depicts the estimated usable lifetime and I think this is one of the most persuasive graphics that I can possibly share with anyone because the different colors designate how much time is left. So if you look at orange, red, brown, less than 50 years. If you look at just the red, it's less than 25. The browns, the browns are basically done. Now, the parameters that were used to make these calculations have certain assumptions like the use of a well at 200 gallons per minute and so forth. So it doesn't mean it's absolutely dry everywhere in those brown areas. But in terms of economic feasibility, we're pretty well past the point. So if nothing changes, this will all be brown. So that is why it is a critical issue. And we have a lot of attention to that issue right now which we need. We need um, thinkers and policymakers and decision makers at all levels to be communicating and collaborating and working together to figure out how are we going to address this? How are we going to preserve Western Kansas? And there are ways that we know of that can go a long way to doing that. So um, issue number one. Issue number two, reservoir sedimentation. So I talked about the federal reservoirs that we have contracts with. The reservoirs provide water supply to two thirds of the Kansas population. Reservoirs fill up with sediment over time. 
It's not a surprise. It's not a mistake. That's what they do. Reservoirs are designed knowing that they are a finite infrastructure because as water flows, it carries sediment. When you stop it behind a dam and it sits still, the sediment drops. So over time, reservoirs fill in with sediment, particularly in Kansas, where we have the kind of soils that as the rivers flow through, they pick up a lot of sediment. So what we're looking at here is a depiction of the reservoirs. Each line is a reservoir that depicts our storage capacity that we've contracted for, as I mentioned earlier. The brown is how much of our contracted capacity is currently silted in. How much capacity have we lost as of right now? So the one that we are focused on the most is Tuttle Creek Lake, which is now about half full of sediment. That is the workhorse for all of eastern, northeastern Kansas. That is the Kansas River Basin. There's so, I mean, it, it impacts Topeka, Manhattan, Johnson County, Kansas City, all communities in between. So if Tuttle is shrinking, we have problems downstream. Next slide. This is a projection to 2070. Again, if we don't do anything, Tuttle will be 90% full of sediment. So this is a completely unacceptable outcome. Um, the idea of dredging comes up. And some of you may be aware that a number of years ago, um, conventional dredging was done on John Redmond Lake at great expense. Um, John Redmond is the lake that provides the cooling water for Wolf Creek Nuclear Power Plant. And the dredging did remove a lot of sediment. It was incredibly expensive and the state had to take out a bond. We were paying a million dollars a year just to pay off the bond. And again, thank you to the legislature and Governor Kelly. That bond was paid off this last spring. So that debt is erased. That interest is saved. But Conventional dredging is not economically feasible to just do elsewhere. And it's a one-time fix and it's a temporary fix because sediment's gonna keep coming in. So there is a pilot project that the legislature has provided the money for. Um, we built up the money over time and we got enough to partner with the Corps of Engineers on Tuttle Creek Lake. So the planning is in the works and equipment is going to be purchased and the project will be designed to do something called water injection dredging. And what that is, is like a barge that travels across the water, injects deep to the bottom, high pressure, that resuspends that sediment. So that the idea being it's resuspended so it will float out more easily. Kind of mimicking what the river would probably do if the dam wasn't there. As you can imagine, that requires all kinds of study and science and engineering and planning for what are the impacts downstream because they wanna make sure that the sediment flowing out isn't going to be a problem for public water intakes downstream, for wildlife habitat and all of that. So that comprehensive planning is now underway and hopefully that mechanism will be on the water in 2024. It's a proven technology in harbors and waterways. It hasn't yet been used in a reservoir setting. So this is exciting. And the Corps of Engineers actually suggested it to us. So they're very motivated and excited about it as well. And it has a lot of promise. So that would be something that could help address this issue and be an ongoing um, solution or partial solution to sedimentation because it's not just take it out and you're done and it comes back. It's a way of keeping that sediment moving. Next slide. So we talked about the Ogallala Aquifer. We talked about reservoir sedimentation. The third big issue are water quality concerns. 
And as I mentioned at the outset of my presentation, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, this is their domain. They are the experts. They handle these things. But we work with them. Water plan studies them, addresses them. So we work with them on implementation. So to just to kind of touch on a couple of issues, a groundwater quality concern that the state has is nitrate contamination. And this is um, a KDHE slide. This depicts areas of increasing nitrate contamination. All of those little dots are areas of concern. And where you see the reds, oranges, yellows, those are areas that are above the safe drinking water limit. To address nitrate contamination requires the expenditure of a lot of money. These small communities, um, there was an article recently published that did a survey of what would the per capita cost be for the people that live in small communities to build a treatment plant, to clean up their water. And the cost per capita per man, woman, and child varied anywhere from $1,100 to $19,000. These things are not feasible to just build treatment plants for. So we have to come up with um, a way to address this. This problem is a result of nutrient runoff. So we need to be um, mindful of how we address that. But the fact remains that this is ongoing. And again, we need, we need to find a way um, to keep our waters clean and to clean up the problems that we have. That was a groundwater quality concern. Next slide represents a surface water quality concern, also a result of, um, largely a result of nutrient runoff. The creation of harmful algal blooms, which is uh, algae in the lakes that creates a toxin. And this represents areas where KDHE has issued watches, warnings, and hazard designations throughout the state this last year. When there is um, a designation from KDHE, they can close the lake. So you might think you're going boating, you might going fishing, you're going to the beach, you're going to let your dog swim. No, no, got a, no contact with the water. You cannot, cannot access that. Next slide, please. The last big issue area I'll touch on, I kind of touched on before when I talked about droughts. The vulnerability to extreme events is something we have to um, plan for. The water plan does address it. And um, we have droughts, floods, and we have climate change on top of that, which is making both of those problems a lot worse. These, this slide and the one after it just are sort of an at a glance, let's look at the trend. So when you start at the upper left in 1901, those were the average or the, the annual temperature normals. Then you move down to the lower right and the average temperatures are much higher. Next slide, please. This next slide is similar. It talks about precipitation. So again, you can see a dramatic change from the upper left to the lower right. You might notice Kansas right kind of there in the middle of that. The projections for Kansas are that eastern Kansas will get wetter, or at least, as we're already seeing, instead of sort of seasonal rains, there will be more intense events that happen, a whole lot of water all at once, while western Kansas gets drier. So, um, as I said, the water plan addresses this, discusses it, sets out recommendations. Um, for ways that we can plan for it and hopefully um, develop our resiliency to it. The next slide is that drought declaration I mentioned earlier. And this was the most recent um, drought declaration map issued on September 30. This remains in effect and in force until modified. So my office is constantly monitoring drought conditions and in touch with um, other agencies. And as I said, when it's deemed um, necessary and appropriate, then there's a drought response team recommend to the governor to, to modify those designations. Next slide. 
as I mentioned, the Kansas Water Plan is that big 300 some page document. And that, as I said, includes a lot of recommendations for things that we're doing that we need to do more, things that we need to do that we're not doing. There are things in place. There is no complete fix for any of this, but there are things we do need to work on, things we can do. And I haven't gone into those specifics today. I'm happy to do that at some point. Um, but I wanted you to come away with the idea that there are definitely things we can do. We have tools, we have strategies, they need funding and they need support. Um, but this is the annual report. This picture here, you all have a copy of it. That advisory board, the Kansas Water Authority, issues their annual report every year to the legislature and the governor saying, the money that you gave us in the state water plan fund to pay for things in the water plan, here's what we did with it. These are those programs. And it includes policy recommendations and um, funding recommendations for the coming fiscal year as well. So you all have that um, at your quick reference. One thing I'll mention in closing is I commend this committee very highly for asking for water information because what you do is not separate from our water needs and we definitely will benefit from working together. One connection I will make that you might not have known is the Ogallala Aquifer depletion. One of the things that is proving very successful is um, the use of precision agriculture with technology to reduce the amount of water used, but still develop um, productivity to the extent that it's more profitable. The Division of Water Resources has um, local enhanced management areas and water conservation areas. I could provide this another information another day, but these are proving to work. But what we need to use the technology, what the producers need is broadband to be able to use their phones and see what's my soil moisture probe telling me? What is this information telling me? For, for our water saving strategies to work, they have to have broadband. So I'm just mentioning, I'm not trying to get in your lane, but that's an illustration of the connections that we do have and how I'd be happy to work together. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Very good, good presentation and I appreciate you coming in here. Uh, we'll open the floor to questions and Representative Schreiber, do you have one? above us mm -hmm. and also flowing into John Redmond, which, as you said, provides the feedstocks, so right. to speak, for Wolf Creek right. uh, are, are important situations. But I remember seeing a, a map at one time that there was a huge backlog of stream bank stabilization uh, projects mm -hmm. in, in that Deosha Basin. And, uh, you know, uh, we aren't going to be around to see, by, uh, to see all of them implemented. So I'm just wondering... Is it still an issue? Uh, and if so, uh, how how's the authority or the office uh, addressing that? Yeah, it's it's still very much an issue. And as I said, I, I avoided kind of getting into the weeds about um, specific projects, but stream bank stabilization projects have been something that has been um, included in the state water plan funds. It's one of the line items to be paid for every year the water authority, the advisory board requests funding and sometimes additional funding for the, for that activity. And that is um, very important to water quality. The Department of Health and Environment is involved with their RAPS program with, this, with that same area of the state. And it's important for the reservoir sedimentation because it also helps reduce that. 
So that is very much still an activity that is a very important um, effort. And we continue to request funding to expand that as much as we can. Uh, and uh, I'd like to discuss that with you further, but outside the committee, that okay. appreciate it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Roth, please. Thanks for your presentation. It was really good. It makes me have lots of questions and I'm new on the committee. Uh, do, do the, the, Ogl the Ogallala Aquifer, uh, do you think that the John Redmond Reservoir in Colorado had anything to do with the depletion of uh, the aquifer or the, the lowering of the levels of the aquifer? I mean, John Martin? John Martin, yeah. Reservoir? That's okay. I do that all the time. <laughs> um, the John Martin Reservoir in Colorado is part of, for those, uh, forgive me, that it's part of the Arkansas River, although Colorado calls it the Arkansas River. Um, it's part of that basin, and we have the Kansas-Colorado Compact regarding the use of that river, including the use of John Martin Reservoir. So that um, Colorado is currently in compliance with the water that they are supposed to be sending across state line. It's, it is true that Colorado's previous violations under the compact reduced the amount of water coming into Kansas. That was largely surface water. And true, there are connections that could help recharge, but that is not the primary cause. And that's probably way, way, way down the list of um, causes of the Ogallala depletion. The Ogallala depletion is simply, there is a finite amount and we've been using more than is sustainable. Okay, so you said there was a finite amount, mm -hmm. but in my mind that, that the aquifer was refilled by the flow of water coming from the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and, and, that, and there's an underground flow there that I understand as well, but that has all been kind of depleted. Mm -hmm. And so if you're saying that, that there's just, uh, you've got a cup of water and, and one day that cup of water is going to be gone and never filled again. I don't, I, I don't understand that uh, other than other states building dams and, and preventing the water flow from, from coming in and, and refilling the aquifer. So, um, uh, and then, and then just for a, an, another question, sorry to jump ahead here, but when was the last reservoir built in Kansas? I should have that on the top of my head, but I don't. We, we'd be happy to get you that information. Yeah, just a question. And there's no plans to build any, any further reservoirs in Kansas? Not that I'm aware of at this time. But, but I would circle back to, to the concept of water coming from Colorado to refill the aquifers. The the surface water that was coming from Colorado fundamentally was surface water with ditch irrigation. And as soon as it got across the state line, Kansas users through ditch irrigation systems are immediately using it. There is a connection between surface and groundwater. Groundwater does move. And there is a very, very slow movement of some groundwater beneath, but it's not to the level of being able to restore or replenish the aquifer. It's nowhere near to make up for the, pardon me, for the use that we're making, taking the water out. And so the, so let's just take Ford County for existence. Mm -hmm. So in the sixties. Representative. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. one, speaking of the mic, cause we can barely hear you, but two, I do want to kind of tailor the questions because of the, of time here we've got another speaker that's good so, that's all my i'd be happy to chat with you anytime thank you sorry no thank you uh representative penn thank you mr chairman and thank you director Owens, for uh, coming before to before us today i appreciate the uh, very comprehensive rundown uh, i'm new to the committee so i'm about as deep as what you went into today so thank you for that uh to know a little bit about how i operate uh i think that government is not necessarily the answer 
or the solution primarily to a lot of the problems that we have. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see more uh, public-private partnership because I think if, if everybody has some skin in the game, they can bring some ingenuity and venomness uh, to the to the table as well. Could you speak very quickly about that? Because when you say that we uh, and my colleagues and I, you know, we we did that. Uh, those votes to pay down all those debts on yes. the budget last year. Thank you for that recognition. We do appreciate that. Um, my question and concern is when we're looking at some of those new technologies, like you're talking about the dredging and everything, are we setting ourselves back up to have yet another balloon uh, payment that we have to pay down? And what is it that you're uh, proposed to do with private industry to maybe uh, get some skin in the game to help fund those types of things as well? I'm glad you asked that because public-private partnerships is – at the risk of being too alliterative, are a high priority for our office. And that is the, the cooperative nature and, and coordinating function that is our marching orders. That's part of what we are expected to do. And we do have very promising ongoing partnerships with um, private entities and local entities and corporations are more and more interested in um, carbon capture, in environmental sustainability. They're, I don't, this is getting a little out of my lane, but their investment ratings, I think, are better if they have sustainability activities. So we're seeing more and more investment interest from the private sector in water reduction activities and stream bank stabilization activities and things like that. And, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the quick follow-up, just a comment. And I appreciate you saying that as we go forward, I would love to have that conversation with you uh, and the colleagues as well, uh, where we're talking about bringing more private industry to the table, because as we try to make Kansas work for everyone, they need to have skin in the game, seat at the table while you, the state has the responsibility. We understand that. And as much as you can educate us and help us to make that uh, relationship work, I'd appreciate it. I would welcome that. That would be very helpful. Very good comments, Representative. Uh, Representative uh, Jean. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, very good, young lady. Really enjoyed that. I'm from Atchison, and we're surrounded by dams. <clears throat> Who owns those dams? They were built. Like you say, the, the mm -hmm. help flooding is what was why they were built, but they're built all the way around the town. I would have to um, ask your indulgence to follow up on that question, because a number of dams exist that are not these federal reservoir dams. And I don't know off the top of my head exactly what all is in that area, but I'd be very happy to follow up. And, uh, <clears throat> now I live in Pittsburgh and we built, we built a big lake. Forgive mm -hmm. me, I can't think of the lake. And it supplies a lot of the towns with water around. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you say, it's very successful and it's very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if it's if it's public or, or mm -hmm. uh, who owns it, but like you say, it was built about 15 years ago. <clears throat> and even though it's not a reservoir, it's a big body of water that does a lot of service for Southeast Kansas. So. Right. And we have... Um, there's someone on my staff that if he was here today, he could rattle off every absolute detail about all of that for you. So we'd be happy to be in communication if you'd like. And one more, if I could. Uh, I took a group of students out to the water treatment plant. Mm -hmm. And the water they bring in, when it's released, it's cleaner than what the people get out of their tap. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, when we release it, we release it into a creek. Can't we save a lot of that water and just reuse it instead of sending it downstream? It's interesting that you say that because Garden City is, and I know that's a different hydrogeological area, but Garden City is an incredible leader in a water use project that they have going on there because being dependent on the Ogallala, it's a matter of necessity that, that they develop a strategy like that. And they have a partnership with the... Department of Wildlife and Parks, local irrigator, local industry for just that purpose where they are, they have a number of partnerships that help reuse and recycle that water for a number of uses. 
They've gotten um, a significant grant from the Bureau of Reclamation to make that happen. My office has been financially supporting that as well. So there are, you're right about that. You hit the nail on the head. Water reuse is something we need to look at more and more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the briefing today. It was very informative. I'm like uh, my colleague over there on the other side. I'm as deep as this briefing now on, uh, on this topic. Uh, I think one of the most amazing things that I heard today is that we have to pay to get our water back, that we have to buy our water back, uh, you know, it had to pay. And so I wonder, can you expand on how that works, that we Just have a the, contract and okay. we're, we're paying to get our control of our water? Well, and the reservoir would not exist, but for the federal government. It's their reservoir. And when you deal with the federal government, you're not on in equal bargaining footing, so to speak. But at the time that the opportunity came up when these were being planned, um, the state had the opportunity to sign contracts for storage space in those reservoirs. And I think the state had a lot of foresight in saying, yes, we definitely want to be able to lock up in some fashion, the ability to use water out of that reservoir. So it gets into a little bit of, of tricky and almost legal semantics to talk about our water and whose water it is. But we would not, but for those contracts, we would not be able to use the water out of those federal reservoirs at all. But now we have the opportunity to completely make it our bailiwick to and actually make it our water. I, I, I appreciate it. It's just that I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around the idea that the waters in our state, we have to pay the federal government to use it. Yeah. I, and and waters, waters probably. flow from state to state too, which is why they're all the interstate compacts that we have and, you know, it may be here today, but it's down there later. And of course, everybody wants to find a way to use it the most when it's in their state. So that's where we have. Thank you. We've got time for just a few more questions. Uh, Representative Shalane Saban. This is just a comment, not a question. If Kansas wants to build its own reservoirs, we'll have control of our own water. And to my ranking member here, Mr. Hobson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony today. Um, if you can, I know you talked about, just to follow up with what Representative Rod had talked about with respect to the um, flow of water coming in from Colorado. Um, if I was to take you back in time, so was 2014 or 2015, the dispute between uh, Kansas and Nebraska, mm -hmm. are there still litigations going on right now with respect to the water usage uh, from that area to the um, state of Kansas? Is there still litigation going on at this particular the, time? That's the, the Republican River. Yes. And it um, actually starts in Colorado, flows into Kansas, up in Nebraska, and then back into Kansas. And there was a Supreme Court lawsuit about it, and there was a settlement reached, and there were some compliance issues at one time, but my understanding, and this is the Division of Water Resources in the Department of Ag, this is their, their um, they're the lead on that. But my understanding is Nebraska is in compliance, in compliance with the settlement. And so. You mentioned with regards to his question with regards mm -hmm. to Colorado, you know. Yeah. Then. So right now we're in, we're in good shape, good relations and, and people are behaving. <laughs> okay. And just, just for the sake of time, I know that uh, you did talk about ways for us to preserve water in western kansas if you can actually I, we're, we're not going to i'm going to ask you to uh, give your thoughts but if you can share with the committee and write in terms of your ideas in terms of how we can actually preserve water in western kansas that would be helpful just for the sake of time oh how much your, do you want <laughs> <laughs> just ideas that you know you might have because of course in western kansas you know yeah, we'd be ha i'd be happy to summarize what i was referring to but. okay that's fine and just a real brief question here kind of a follow-up to Representative Proctor, but earlier in, you talked about Lawrence gets their water from Clinton Lake. Some of their water, yes. Some of it, okay. Then the water office has a contract with the feds for that water. 
So my question was, who maintains the lakes? Is it the feds? That's a good question. And yeah. if that's the case, you mentioned earlier, specifically John Redmond Lake, it costs Kansas taxpayers to do some maintenance on it. So who owns these? Who's paying for it? When water is called into service, meaning there's a customer like Lawrence that has a contract to use it, that triggers operation and maintenance costs that we have to help pay for. Before that, that's on the core. Now, I can't speak to the arrangements that were made with the John Redmond dredging because I wasn't in this role and I'd be happy to get you more information about that, but I just don't have the, the depth of knowledge about and the memory to explain how that happened. But the operation and maintenance costs are shared between the state and the feds when water is called into service. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Thank Appreciate you very much for time. having me. Um, if you'd like to come back, please reach out. Um, would always love to hear from your office, though. Well, if there's if there's any question that comes up, I'm happy to help out. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Next up, we've got an information briefing from Kansas Cable Telecom Association with Mr. Federico. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'd say kudos to you for that presentation. Um, I, I helped run the Leadership Kansas program for 15 years, and every year we had a presentation on water, and it was always one of the most important conversations we had because people just don't know how important it is or they overlook how important it is. So, again, my compliments. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'll be relatively brief. Um, my name is John Federico, uh, and Mr. Chairman, I, I wondered if I could reserve just a few minutes at the end of my uh, comments to allow Megan Bottenberg from Cox to present, give it a local flavor, if you would. I would like that. I haven't heard too much from her this year, so I'm pleased to see her here. So well, I have, and count your blessings. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll talk offline on that one later. <laughs> Uh, my goal is just to provide a broad overview of uh, our industry on behalf of our members. Again, uh, it's the cable, uh, it's the Kansas Cable Telecommunications Association, the KCTA, and our members provide uh, video, voice, and broadband to both urban and rural parts of the state, all four corners of the state. Uh, some of our members are recognizable to you, Cox, Charter, Comcast, Midco, Vive, uh, Cable One, Sparklight, Mediacom, among others. Um, pestering you in the Capitol um, will be uh, myself and, of course, Stephen Durst, uh, Adam Lusker, who's uh, joined us in the room, and other members of our staff. And um, as part of our uh, prisoner rehabilitation initiative, we also contract with Dan Murray. <laughs> I can never just compliment the guy. I have to. Uh, I've been at this in the building for 30 years. 27 of those years have been working with this industry. I serve as the president of the association of the KCTA, in addition to the Federico Durst consulting responsibilities. Um, you would think after 27 years that I would be an expert on the technical aspect of this. Um, if you saw. Adam and I trying to hang a TV and connect it to our cable box this week in our office where it took three days. Uh, you would know that I'm not the technical expert, but I am certainly the policy expert. And I have died a thousand deaths in this uh, building fighting for our members. And it's we don't go looking for trouble necessarily. Um, this is an industry that really works best with a very light regulatory touch. It is constantly evolving and it, it's changing and we need to be a little nimble. Most of our fights are the unintended consequences when you all as policymakers pass a law that would inadvertently benefit one of our competitors to the detriment of our members. 
And so we just keep a close eye on that. And again, it's, it's unintentional, but we want to remind you that this is an incredibly competitive environment by which we work in. It requires a lot of private capital investment. We are not a subsidized industry. So the things that you do, they matter greatly to us. And on a national level, this industry is no different than many others. They look, they have limited money that they're going to invest, whether it be upgrading their system, um, providing low cost um, um, internet service. They, they look favorably on those states that are, uh, you know, that, that their regulations, their taxing um, is more favorable to that industry. Um, so those are the things we can talk about that another day. Uh, there's been really two big changes uh, that I would uh, chat about uh, that have since the inception of cable TV. And one is you think about your own world and how you consume this product. It used to be you were limited to watching a show at eight o'clock and you recorded it if you couldn't make it. And now everybody wants what they want, when they want it, where they want it. So it's changed quite a bit. The other is the level of competition uh, from this industry. When we started, you could, um, you could argue that we were a monopoly. Um, now the competition is uh, rather robust, um, which goes back to uh, allowing us uh, to compete. I mean, we have uh, satellite TV, we have direct streaming video into your uh, devices, uh, Google, uh, we have fiber only companies out there providing uh, internet. Sometimes even local governments decide that they wanna build their own network for whatever crazy reason. Um, and so we take all that into consideration. Um, since the inception of cable television, Cable operators, both nationally and in Kansas, have been innovators in the development and deployment of the advanced telecommunication technologies that they believe that their customers need and really demand. Um, despite being a relatively new commodity, uh, internet connectivity intertwines nearly every aspect of our lives. Um, so how do you combat that where the demand is so great and it is becoming more and more important in our everyday lives? You invest because what we have to constantly stay ahead of is our customers want better and faster. And so uh, that there's almost $300 billion of investment since uh, nationally, since uh, the inception of cable, and um, in Kansas, uh, we've invested over $3 billion, um, and uh, we employ almost 18,000 Kansans. Um, the other thing I want to note is that going back to the better and faster aspect, between 2015 and 2021, speeds of our providers' most popular tiers have increased 16%, while prices have decreased 28%. The fastest speed tiers have increased by 28%, with prices coming down 44%. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I think uh, the combination of our investment in the telecom space and your focus on allowing us creating that favorable uh, environment, um, whether it was worth it or not, I think when the pandemic hit, it was really proof that this investment matters. If you think about the strain, the unexpected, all of a sudden strain on the system, on the pipe that's carrying all this stuff to your home, uh, and every aspect of your life required you working from home, whether it be your kid's education, whether it be sometimes your health care, your work, 
how much more time you were watching Netflix or doing things like that. And there was barely an interruption. And so having that backbone is important, not only nationally, but uh, here in, uh, I'm sorry, in Kansas. Um, KCTA members stepped up during that time as well. And you can imagine that there was a decrease in income for many families. Um, not only did we try to connect as many people as possible and work with the communities that we serve to make sure that the things that they needed, their libraries or whatever, had what they needed, we also didn't shut anybody off, regardless of your ability to pay. And I think that was a proud moment for our industry. So we talk a lot about the digital divide. How, does, uh, how, do, how do we close that? Well, uh, individual cable operators are spreading the word on their programs that offer free or reduced cost services to people who might not otherwise be able uh, to afford those. You'll hear a little bit about that from uh, Ms. Bottenberg through their program, but basically um, these are cable sponsored, low cost broadband adoption programs. And nationally, we've connected 18 million consumers that under our regular pricing would not have been able to afford it. Again, another uh, proud moment for our industry. Uh, We also embarked on a uh, digital literacy program. You know, not everybody, um, uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, Some people are intimidated, and this would mostly apply to seniors, perhaps. Um, How does this thing work? Do I need it? So it might be available uh, to them, but they don't uh, subscribe to this service because they don't feel they need it or they don't feel they understand it. So there's a fair amount of effort that's been made to try to make sure that they know what they have and what's available to them, basically bring the whole world into their, uh, their living room. So Kansas specific, let's talk about supporting um, efforts to connect every Kansan. While uh, most Kansans have some access to broadband services, KCTA continues to focus on addressing unserved and underserved gaps ensuring that the quality of service provided offers Kansan the best opportunity to compete in what is now a global marketplace. Uh, The federal government has committed almost $140 billion back to the states to see if we can expand, expand broadband into the unserved and underserved communities. Those two words are incredibly important to us. If a dollar from the federal government or the state goes to a a, uh, provider and it is being used to compete against a provider that's already there, that is investing their own private capital to be there and serve their customers, we think that is a wasted opportunity. It is not a good use of that money. The primary focus of any of this money that flows down from the, from the feds or is collected by the state in whatever means should first go into those unserved communities. They have no options for broadband. The second tier of focus should be the underserved where perhaps they only have one provider. And competition is good in any business you have. And we welcome competition. We're, we're not in the most rural parts of the state. They're very expensive to get there, and you generally won't find us. And that's where these, uh, these dollars should be spent. And we applaud the efforts um, of the federal government to focus on unserved and underserved in the state as well. Um, we do have some hiccups, we feel. Um, there is, uh, again, keeping it closer to Kansas, There is a program that is administered by the Department of Commerce and the Office of Broadband Development called the Kansas Capital Projects Fund, uh, CPF. In three different stages, they gave away $83.5 million of those federal funds, and they matched it with uh, matching grants from either the provider, the community, or what have you. Um, Let me read that. What they tried to accomplish is uh, trying to get broadband to critical areas of the state that lack access. Uh, It is an 
$83.5 million investment combined with almost $42 million in matching funds. And this will result in more than uh, 24,500 homes, businesses, schools, healthcare facilities, and other public institutions to be connected to fast, reliable internet service. That program, they had 83 million available to them. There was uh, 141 applications uh, of projects and totaling $600 million. So they had to be very choosy in the projects that they uh, were going to support. We would ask you, one of the things, and our members applied for some of those, very few got them. Um, we are not complaining about it. One of the things that we would ask you as policymakers to look at is the transparency of that entire program to help us understand why this application was rejected, um, what's the map look like of the service area. There is actually very limited information available to our members that would help me explain to them uh, why they weren't awarded a grant, but ABC business was. We only think that's fair that perhaps there's something that we can do to, to help me uh, explain how that all worked. Um, at the end of the day, it was a process that had to get started quickly, implemented quickly. They did a very good job overall, but there are still a lot of unanswered questions, uh, and it was an imperfect process. Mr. Chairman, I'll try to move along quickly here. Um, so uh, what's next? Let's talk about where we, were, we are as a community right now. Um, in 2023, it is expected that there will be 29 billion devices that are connected to the Internet. And if you think about your own home or your own office and what you have connected, whether it be an iPad, a computer, your phone, I mean, whatever it is, it, it's incredible. Gaming is growing exponentially, um, 10 times faster than any other area. And that requires a lot of bandwidth. I'm not a gamer, but uh, that's, that's a big deal. The other is streaming video, the aforementioned Netflix. Uh, how are you receiving some of your things? Hulu, Netflix, um, Disney Channel, what have you. Um, those, those services have quadrupled, quadrupled in the last five years. And lastly, the internet itself, how you're using it, you're very rarely is it being used to look up uh, what time does the movie start? That's easy, right? Doesn't require a lot of bandwidth. Mostly though, these are rich, immersive experiences, whether it be watching video, um, multimedia uses, uh, Zoom, Teams, what have you, uh, and, and gaming. Um, all that requires is a lot more information going through the pipe to get to you. Our answer in the cable industry is 10G. You've heard of 5G. We are now rolling out 10G. You all should have received something in the mail that would explain uh, what we see as the future of being able to handle this growth. And, um, and um, we're pretty excited about it. And we'll provide you more information on that, Mr. Chairman, another time. So our ask, very, very, it's very rare that we would come to you and say, we need this or that. Usually we are in defense. We get how it works. Let us go compete. Our product, our pricing, our service, that's kind of how we operate best. And so anything you can do to continue to maintain a level playing field, uh, it helps our, our folks. Um, the other is the transparency we just spoke about. Let's, whatever process we do for providing subsidies to folks, let's make sure we know why and where, it, where it's going. Um, back to that level playing field. Again, um, I'll give you one example, and this is a conversation for another day. When we look at some of our competitors and what their customers have to pay in total for fees and taxes, some are zero. Another is 6%. And our customers, when you add everything together, none of which we want to charge them, it's all put on us. And we pass it through to the consumer. So this is a direct charge to the consumer. We are up to 17.5%. 
and it varies because one community might charge a smaller franchise fee, but 17 and a half percent when our competitors are either at six or zero. That's what their customers are paying. There's only one state in the entire country that is at a higher rate, and it's just by a, a hair, and that's Nebraska. We are ranked 49th in what our customers have to pay to get our service. So at some point, we'd like to address that. We're not quite sure what form that should take. The chairman, again, thank you for the opportunity. We're going to continue to invest to make sure that we have available to our folks as good a technology as you'll find in the country. Thank you. That, sir. And I don't know if you'd like yeah, to. I was just going to ask, do you want to take questions now or do you want to introduce first? Let's, uh, let Ms. Bottenberg and perhaps she'll take the brunt of them. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, welcome. It's good to see you. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you. Um, actually, Stephen will take the brunt of all the questions. Um, I um, appreciate the opportunity to just talk briefly about Cox Communications. Um, I think I've met most of you and worked with you in the past, but just to kind of give you a quick overview, Cox serves, um, we have currently over a hundred franchise communities here in Kansas. I think the last time I was before you, I said we were at 92. Um, in literally the past year, we've added at least 10 more. And um, I'll get to that in a moment and share more details about that. We serve all communities of all sizes, from Gas, Kansas, um, smallest community, to Wichita, Kansas, um, and all corners of the state, from Garden City to Pittsburgh, um, Topeka to Wichita. So we are proud of the work that we do. We are the third largest cable company in the country, um, but we want to be sure that we take care of each of our communities. And so what you'll see with Cox is that we want to invest in our communities. We want to be a part of the communities. We work there. We live there just as anybody else. We also want to take care of our customers and make sure that they have the solutions and products they need, to John's point, to be sure they have health care services, education services. They're able to work from home. They're able to game. Um, and they're also able to just watch Netflix. Um, as I mentioned, we do give back to our communities. Um, let's see, we um, have nearly $3 million that we have given in charitable contributions just in Kansas alone, and we employ nearly 1,000 employees here in the state. Uh, but because of our contract, um, contractors that we work with, we support nearly 3,000 jobs total. So obviously our economic impact is huge. It's about nine, uh, $910 million, um, of an economic impact that we provide back to the state alone. Um, and as John mentioned, we do um, pay taxes and franchise fees, and that's roughly $39 million, again, that we've contributed back to the state. We have over 10,000 miles of gig-enabled fiber throughout the whole state, and we are adding more fiber every day. Um, let's see. And we have a network supported and monitored 24-7 system. So we know when a system, there are network issues. We watch security issues. Again, we cl closely monitor our network. During the pandemic, it was really interesting because we are all went home, right? And what we saw was the network, um, we had increased network during the day and bandwidth usage, whereas usually it was during the night, but it had switched. People were working, of course, more at home during the day, and that's when they would be able to use it. At that point is when we were able to really see any problems in the network, and we were able to immediately address those. And so that was a great opportunity for us to better our network and ensure that it was working smoothly and for customers. We do prepare for the future. Um, we, in the last 10 years, we've invested more than $19 billion in private dollars, all to add more fiber to our network and also to make sure that we're ready for 10 gig. As John mentioned, we know that's the future. Um, we are also happy to announce that we're going to be adding more gig-enabled services. Right now, all of our customers here in Kansas have 
the capacity of one gig. But this year we'll be adding multiple gig. So of course we're getting faster speeds, meeting our customers' needs and demands. Um, also, we announced in February of last year plans um, to spend more than $400 million over the next three years to expand our footprint to unserved and underserved communities. That is our own private dollars that we are using. And as I previously mentioned, 10 communities that we've added here in Kansas in the one year alone, that's part of our commitment to serving unserved and underserved communities. For instance, Douglas, Kansas was one of the first cities that we were able to add to our footprint in 2022. We are adding more every day as I speak from Ellenwood, Kansas to um, areas of rural Sedgwick and Butler County, um, even here in Shawnee County as well. So we are very excited about that. All of those bills are all fiber to the home and two gig symmetrical speeds. And again, all of our other customers will have the capacity of multiple gig this year as well. So again, we're very excited about the future. Uh, as John mentioned, we do want to help close the digital divide and we have several programs that do that. We have Connect Assist program, which is for families uh, that may not have children in their household that are in school. And so that's $30 a month, but you're on a fixed income. We also have, if you do have children at home uh, in school, we have another program called Connect to Compete. We work with our school districts with that as well. And that too is um, actually that's $10 a month. Uh, no contract, no rental fees. Um, we truly want to help close the digital divide on that. We also participate in the Federal Affordable Connectivity Program, which provides a $30 credit each month to a eligible customer's bill. So again, closing that digital divide. But we also work with some of your communities that you serve on pilot projects. So for instance, um, one community um, has digital navigators. And so we work directly with them to provide them information as to low income programs that they can be a part of, help enroll um, people in those low income programs. We also um, work to provide senior citizens with, again, the $30 a month um, through a generous donor in one community. Again, trying to ensure that they have the assistance that they need to make sure that everyone has access to internet. Um, with that, I will take questions or John will take questions, but again, we're very excited about the future um, of Cox here in Kansas. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate you there. I was hoping to have Verse take the questions, but I noticed he ran out of here. So, um, oh, um, Representative Williams, looks like you've got a question. I just had a quick question. With the Kansas Capital Projects Funds, what department does that fall under? Is that uh, with Commerce who decides? Okay. And then I just would like to state, I think that's awesome. You know, I think we've been hearing about broadband access and then with our previous testimony about water and the need for expanding broadband access. Um, I don't know. I would love more information on the rural communities that you're making an impact on just to have that information. If you could provide that, that'd be awesome. Or even which part of that 10,000 miles of gig fiber has been going to rural areas as well. I'd be happy to provide that for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Penn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for coming here to present today. Uh, I'm really excited about what you're talking about. Uh, as I stated before to the earlier presenter, I don't feel that it's the role of government to be the solution, but to be a part of the solution. And I think the visionary uh, leadership that you're exhibiting for what we should be doing in Kansas, uh, the way I see it is we should be doing an infrastructure build so that we uh, attract more business to come and compete into this space. And the government has a, a hand in that. I was just curious, uh, and I think, John, you, you kind of touched on it already, uh, barriers to entry into the competitive space uh, and, and juxtaposing that against consumer protection. Uh, can you lend a little bit more insight to that particular uh, piece as far as private industry is concerned for your members? Yes. Yeah, so for us to deliver our project, it requires uh, cooperation with uh, local units of government. And I think for the most part, uh, they are very willing for us to come into the community if we're going to be upgrading something or expanding our service and providing more competition, more services. Sometimes the right-of-way issues are a little tricky for us, um, but really it is um, us competing with subsidized competitors. If I had to say that 
there was one big deal that prevents us from investing more. That's it. You can't hardly make a business case when you have a subsidized competitor. Again, we preach to our people, we don't come up here and whine. If you have a problem, offer a solution and see if these guys uh, are willing to help. But I say that in a matter of fact way to answer your question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that opportunity to ask, ask that question. Uh, and when we're looking at the future vision piece, if, if you all couch your terms and talk to your members of, about reaching out to us, as far as investing in the infrastructure of Kansas, uh, I think that's a role that government should be playing in, and we should expend funds in that way, but not picking winners and losers in that space. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Say, being on this committee last time, I, I know there's a state office of broadband, correct? And I just wondered, what's the relationship or with of your members with that office, uh, for better or for worse? Thanks. Yeah, fantastic. So they just stood that office up and it really became relevant as this money started to flow down uh, with all due respect. Uh, it, it's been good. Jade uh, uh, does a very good job, very accessible. Um, again, I voiced our concerns with full awareness of how challenged they were to put a stand up a system to distribute this money in a very quick manner and keep it fair. They were understaffed for a long time. Um, so the relationship is good. We think there can be improvements and transparency in government never hurts. And that's kind of what we're focused on right now. See if we can get answers to our questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very, very good. And I do plan on having Jade in here <laughs> at a future date to tes testify. Um, quick question. You had the card and we, I received a copy of it in my home also about the 10G. When I read 5G, I'm thinking fifth gen cellular. But when I'm reading that, isn't that talking about five gig bandwidth? Kind of different subjects there. Correct. So uh, 5G, what you know is more of the wireless um, and fifth generation. This is 10 gig. So when we talk about one gig cap capabilities, it's speed. Um, and then we're just looking at 10 gig now. So again, it's a multi- um, tier approach, so a uh, phased in approach to get to 10 gig because we are always upgrading our network. One of the things I did fail to mention was that as part of getting prepared for 10 gig speeds, um, we're, we're splitting our network nodes. So let's, for instance, a node serves 500 homes. In order for us to maximize and build additional capacity, we split that one node into two nodes. So one node may serve 250 homes and another node serves 250 homes. Again, that increases our capacity. We're adding more fiber deeper into the network so that we have greater speeds. Um, and the other thing too, is we anticipate you to have, I have 10 devices on my network at home and it's just me and my kid. Um, imagine what a family of four or a family of six, how many they would have. Um, and especially not just now, but into the future. And so you definitely have to be prepared for 10 gig. Very good answer. I appreciate it. And for John, I'm going to say to the body, you heard it here today, January 19th. I guess it sounds like it's an, a quest to ax the cable tax, isn't it? So... <laughs> You'd get no argument from us. That's a great line. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and to the committee, in case, for, mainly for the new ones here, um, why are we having these information hearings? Uh, I was really pleased to see Megan here. I was hoping we could have caught Durst for just a little bit too. But uh, as we move along, and we're going to be start getting bills in like we started the day, we're going to start working those bills. We're going to start hearing them, et cetera. It gives you guys a chance to have a face and a contact of who the experts are on this and feel free to run to them. That's the reason they are here. Um, and it just gets you some basic information. So that's the purpose of this. And as, as we tr progress along here, we're gonna have less and less of the informational hearings and we're gonna start diving into bills. So appreciate everybody being here. And with that said, we are adjourned. <laughs>